Welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and I thank you so much for joining us here as we bring you uh, new paradigms for a new world, as well as choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. We are here, folks, uh, Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m., Wednesdays at 9 a.m., and then Monday through Friday, 8 to 9 a.m., that's nine programs, nine different guests, nine different conversations. We certainly hope that you'll tune into one, if not all of them. We're podcasting those programs as well on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, many other locations as well. And let's see, we're also on YouTube. That's right. YouTube, where uh, you can watch these conversations. I hope you'll subscribe and then click notification. So that uh, when I do post a new conversation, uh, you'll be notified and you'll be able to tune in and listen to that conversation. Also, if you'd like to support the work that we are doing financially, we do have a PayPal account. It is there for your security as well as ours. And um, the email they're going to ask you for, to whom you're sending the support to, it's richard at richarddugan.com. That's richard at richarddugan.com. We also ask that you take time during this, the decade of perfect vision, to spend time <clears throat> going within, listening to that still small voice, maybe spending some time just listening. Maybe if you have a chance to, such as I, to sit out in nature, out in the middle of, so to speak, nowhere. Uh, nowhere is still somewhere. And just listen. I was standing out uh, the other morning following the rains that we were, were having here in uh, Central and Southern California. And just listening to the birds. Uh, whether they were just singing because they wanted to sing or they were having a conversation. Uh, darned if I know, doesn't matter because it was a beautiful sound, you know, and even the wind when it was blowing through the trees and so forth. So take some time to do that and it, it, it'll help you. I, I, I tell you, it will help you in a big way. Something else that'll help you in a big way is to uh, check out our guest and the work that she is doing. Her name is Janine Bolin. And she has a website. It is called, as she's waving to you, if you're watching on YouTube, The Eight Gates. The Eight Gates. And we're going to talk about the work that she does. Um, and we're hoping that uh, you will uh, check this out. Uh, check out her website as well. Uh, Janine, I want to thank you so much for being with us here on the program. It's uh, it, We've already had a conversation, and it was a really, I enjoyed it very much so. And... Um, I thank you so, so much for being here. Well, and I love it when people invite me back. That means they like the content. That means it helps somebody. And that's what we're here to do. Help anybody who might be struggling just a little bit, who's finding the spring season to be a little bit more chaotic and crazy than they wanted. So yeah, let's get to it. Let's see what we can do to help out your listeners. Well, one of the main focuses that that you have, and I was just looking here at your website, the eight gates.com uh, is your, um, 10 step program to abundance and uh, it's simple, easy and effective. And I know that it's not just now, it's not just in these times in which we live. It seems like it's all the time that we've all been concerned about providing for self, providing for family and others and so forth. Uh, wanting to get ahead, if you will, whatever, whatever that means. I had a, my best friend, Doug, his last name was Jones. Uh, and we used to joke about the, the whole aspect of keeping up with, as the phrase goes, keeping up with the Joneses. Uh, he often wondered why anybody would want to keep up with him and his family. <laughs> he never fully understood that. But, but he wasn't we, big into Instagram because it hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> But at the same time, you know, um, you know, I get I'm not going to say contradictory perspectives, if you will, but it certainly is different ones in terms of, um, for example, when I was a kid growing up and even into the 70s and I would tap into the news and the financial reports, not that they were interesting to me, but it was just I was passing by the TV and there it was. And the basic message back then was debt is good. You, you, you definitely want to have debt. And nowadays, not so much, in spite of the fact that I then saw another, um, another, uh, um, I don't know, a YouTube video, what have you, this gentleman, supposedly a financial wizard or whatever. And he was talking about how you needed both. You needed to both have, uh, uh, you needed to have debt 
because there was this this balancing act, you know, and I know this goes into an uh, an, uh, an arena, an area that you may or may not be uh, that versed in because you deal with with other aspects of of abundance, if you will, and and achieving that other words that we use too um, are prosperity. You know, some people will say wealth. Would I like to have more uh, more zeros and uh, numbers, more numbers, nor digits before the decimal point? Sure. Bring it on. Let me. <laughs> I loved one guy, uh, one one cartoon I saw, Janine, that said uh, that showed this guy. He was leaning up against this table with this pile of money on the other side. He couldn't quite reach it. And, uh, you know, he was saying they say money, money can't buy happiness. Let me try. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's brilliant. <laughs> Talk to me about the foundations of the work that you are doing in this area in particular of abundance. It's, it's, I think really important for people to, uh, um, to take a look at. And I, I'll use one of your quotes from your website. Uh, the question is, does your situation need a do over? Precisely. Yeah. Does your situation need a do-over? So what we're going to talk about right now is money. So if the whole topic of money, the reason why people use prosperity, wealth, all those other sorts of words that are totally appropriate is because to say the word money causes some people to have a physical response that is negative. And so that puts them in a place where they're not able to learn. They're not able to hear what you have to say, unless you say, do you want to make more money? or would you like more money? Then it moves it more into a scale that's a little bit more positive. But I'd like to bring up the topic of debt because you are singing my song. Mm -hmm. When we describe that, you will find on YouTube very good teachers. You will also find teachers who are making money off of you. How do you differentiate the two? This is the way. The first one is anytime somebody says it's good to have debt, realize they're talking about strategic debt. They are not talking about unsecured debt. They're not talking about consumer debt. And the thing that I have taught for the last 25 years has been this. You get yourself out of consumer debt. Your credit cards, if you're not able to pay your credit cards off every month, you are in consumer debt. You do not have the discipline to get into strategic debt yet. And I use the word yet, growth mindset, as my kids always say. We want to make sure that we get you in a place where you are financially able to be a wealth accumulator. Now, what does that mean? It means you're able to save money every month and you don't pull that money out because you're able to save it. And once you get to a point where you're able to save $2,000, and you have $2,000, then I want you to invest it in your IRA, or some of you have a 401k plan. The whole point is, are you able to save money consistently? All right. And once you've learned that, yes, you are able to save money consistently, you are able to pay off your credit cards every month. You're able to make your payments on everything else every month, as long as you are living below your income then you're in a good place, all right? And there's a lot of things that happen. There are so many, so many major events that happen that cause you to fall out of that, such as divorce, a health situation. There's a lot of reasons why people get into debt that are not their fault, okay? And so we wanna make sure I address that too. Mm -hmm. However, when you hear people on YouTube talking about debt, such as Robert Kiyosaki, wonderful guy. He's the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He's been around for over 40 years talking about money. He is three hundred million dollars in debt. However, he's using strategic debt. He knows how money works and he is leveraging money to buy tangible assets. This is a very different philosophy and it's not appropriate for somebody who's making $40,000 or $60,000 a year, is hopeful that their partner doesn't lose their job because the partner's making $40,000 a year. Together, they're making anywhere between sixty dollars to $100,000 a year. You want to make sure that you are leveraging your consumer uh, purchasing so that you are purchasing assets, right? And that's what Robert Kiyosaki talks about. So when people start throwing the word around debt, realize there are fine-tuning definitions that you may want to acquaint yourself with before you do that. Now, I know you wanted me to talk about the 10 steps to abundance, but first I felt we needed to address debt because they use the word, like, and they is anybody who's in the media, 
Okay. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's talking to you, if they use the word debt, you say, are you talking consumer debt or strategic debt? And then go on to chat GPT and say, what are the different definitions of debt or what are the different areas of debt? And let chat GPT start educating you on all the different ways that you can have debt. And just realize it's not as much a word uh, that has only a single definition. And that's what gets people in trouble when they're trying to define for themselves what they want their financial goals to be. What is your area of expertise in regards to finance? Because it sounds like you've got a pretty doggone good uh, perspective, if you will. I have absolutely no expertise in finance. <laughs> okay. I want to be upfront with that. I have to call myself a financial coach and a financial mentor, if you will. I do not have a CPA. I do. I am an analytical biochemist. I was working for Big Pharma. I stumbled across a way to get my family out of debt using the 60-40 principle. I wrote a book for my students who I was, I was teaching mathematics and physics to, and they were having trouble with their grant money running out. You know, they had less money and not enough to get through the semester. And I was watching their grades plummet because they weren't eating right. So I started teaching our freshman classes how to handle budgeting and how to handle that. So my training is I'm not an expert. You know, you don't, I, I encourage you not to listen to me, but to practice some of what I share with you and make sure it works for your family. But it's like, I, I'm not an expert. I don't feel like an expert. I've been teaching it a long time. I've had over 3,000 families I've been able to help. But when it comes to, am I an expert? I have to say, no, I'm an analytical biochemist by training and I'm really good with money. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about strategic debt as I, I i already know what consumer debt is okay. now because i've been through a couple of things and that i'm i'm certainly uh more than happy to share hopefully people will learn from it in my lifetime i have filed bankruptcy twice thought i was going to do it a third time and i said no i'm going to do something different this time so i went through a debt settlement program and i got that knocked down considerably and right now i would have to say by comparison to even the two times that i had the the bankruptcies and even the third time where uh i decided to do debt settlement my my indebtedness and i say my because primarily these things were in my name not my wife's and uh i uh, basically excuse me uh it was probably around 30 to 35 thousand dollars now that was just consumer debt that wasn't including the car or uh the travel trailer we have those kinds of things and right now i would have to say it's probably around ten thousand. just just a rough guesstimate of consumer debt so what how does that compare with strategic debt because I've tried using strategy, if you will, to get out from under the consumer debt. And it's been moderately successful. And I'm I'm happy with the results thus far. Strategic debt is when you invest in something that kicks off cash flow, period. Okay. So it's not about strategy so much as it is about does it pay you every month with cash flow? Mm -hmm. So a travel trailer does not. It is not an asset. It is a liability. It requires maintenance. It requires all kinds of uh, work on it. It needs a place to be stored. It is a liability. It is a cost. Uh, it's, it's in the area of what CPAs like to talk about is it's a liability. It costs you money to own it. Okay. So that is not an asset. Your home is not an asset. It is a liability because you have to live somewhere. Okay. So mm -hmm. now that second home you bought, if you rent it out, or maybe you make it an Airbnb or something like that, and if it's kicking off cash flow to you, ah, now it has moved into the asset category. But until you sell it, it's not an asset. And some people like to look at their homes as, well, I can go ahead and sell it and then whatever equity I have in it, that'll be my income, blah, blah, blah. That is a very impoverished way of looking at your 
liabilities. What you want to do is look at anything that you spend money on, will it bring money to me? Such as if you buy a property that's an Airbnb property. Well, you then you have to be the business owner, right? And make mm -hmm. sure that your expenses are not going to outweigh the cash flow that's going to come to you. So it depends on that location, right? Real estate's all about location, location, location. Well, there's a yeah. reason for that. Is it bringing you in revenue? Another thing is, is uh, gold shares or silver shares. That's another area that Robert Kiyosaki really pushes on is that you want to buy assets. You want things that are going to appreciate in value, things that are going to give you monthly cash flow. Is it paying you money for you to have it? If it pays you money for you to have it on like a cash flow basis, then that is strategic debt. So you are in debt, you bought a property, but it's kicking out money. It's paying for itself and giving you cash in hand. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> and most Americans in particular, most Americans, I would say, probably have uh, consumer debt. Correct. Even student loans would be under the category of consumer debt, as we've as, as you've defined it. Correct. For, for, uh, as opposed to, let's say you were to take that education and you were to get a job that earns you a really nice salary. That still doesn't change it, does it? Because you've already incurred the debt for that education in spite of the fact that you've turned that education into a rather profitable, so to speak, uh, um, large income type of, um, I want to use the word asset, but that still doesn't sound right. <laughs> right? Yeah. You, it's funny how all of a sudden when you start looking at money and what it is doing for you, that it changes the way you look at things. And then all of a sudden you kind of move into that confusing state of, I don't know what to call this. Is it a liability? Is it an asset? I really don't know what to call it, right? That's a wonderful place to be. I encourage people to be in that place because if you're in that place, that means you're redefining for yourself how you wish to move forward with your money. And that is a good place to be, okay? Mm -hmm. So the more confused you are, the more I say, great. That means you're open to learning. If you're too stuck or you think you know what you're doing, then I can't teach you. You're not teachable or coachable. But mm -hmm. if you're a little confused, then you are coachable. And I always encourage you, make sure you surround yourself with mentors or teachers who have your best interest at heart, okay? And nobody's going to have that more than you. But then there are pe really good people out there, good teachers who really do want you to succeed in life. Now, let's talk about education because that's kind of a fuzzy gray area. Uh, some people are like, you can consider it an investment. I'm like, yeah, you consider it an investment if your student loan came from some sort of a grant agency or foundation where you're running a 2.3, something under 5% interest rate. Then I would consider your education an investment because the money that you're able to make from a job to pay off that debt, uh, you're doing just fine. As long as you also have investments that are kicking off and uh, uh, cash flow to pay for the interest as well as the principal. Mm. However, if you paid for that education on a credit card, that is consumer debt. You are now in the 18 to 31% interest category, depending upon the credit card. Yeah. And in some instances, it's even higher. And I even ran into a situation where uh, because of, of the fact that the uh, station that I happened to work for here in Santa Barbara was sold at the end of 2023 and the new owner's pay period is five days later than th what was regularly scheduled. And I was in the process of trying to get all of my, I like to call them vendors and not really, but anyway, uh, to move the pay, uh, the due date five days ahead. So as not to incur late fees. So this happened in February and in March, and I tried to get one of the credit card companies, number one, to move my due date. They refused. Number two, to, uh, to uh, uh, reverse the late fees due to the explanation that I had just given, and they refused. Now, I recognize the person on the phone is not the one who made the rules. But I was still a little miffed. And I said, well, I guess uh, because you folks have made an arbitrary decision uh, that you refuse to um, negotiate, I guess I'm going to have to make an arbitrary decision as to whether or not I'm going to make future payments. Now, I do know that by doing that, 
by not making the payments, that will then affect my credit report and credit score. How important are those two elements in one's financial uh, dealings and so forth when dealing with with money and being able to uh, deal with money, i.e. maybe getting a loan down the road? So I am not a certified public accountant, nor am I a financial planner. I have no credentials to my name. So please take this advice mm -hmm. as a friend talking to you and to your listeners realize sure. I am not educated in this. What I would do in my personal situation, if I found myself like that, is I would go to a credit card company that actually gives me those opportunities. Like on my credit cards, I can move the date around month to month as long as I hit that date. It's amazing how they allow me to do it right on the homepage of my credit card. Do you want to move the payment for next month? It gives you the opportunity to do that, especially if you're traveling. And so one of the things that I would recommend to you is go to a credit card company that does that for you, that was willing to work. Instead of trying to work with people who are obstinate, sell your debt. Banks do this all the time. Mortgage, mortgage companies do it all the time. And you go to that credit card company and say, I would like to put my debt with you. I'm very good at paying. They'll be able to see how you've been very good or since you, you know, you were talking about since I've been working myself out of this hole. Um, anyway, say, I would like to give you my debt. I have a credit card company that's not willing to work with me. My employment uh, changed the date that I'm paid. Would you be willing to work with me on that debt? And then I'll, I'll give you the debt. And they will say, why, yes, we would. Mm -hmm. And you sell, you know, basically we don't get to sell our debt like banks do, <laughs> but we can, we can offer our debt to other places that are willing to work with you. And that's interesting too. And it's one of those aspects of money that a lot of people, they don't fully understand. And I remember, and this was the first bankruptcy was due to my divorce from my first wife. And I got all the debt. I was in a community property state, Arizona, and I got all the debt. But that was sort of agreed to. And um, of course, as I began to investigate this, I found out when I filed that first bankruptcy uh, that I could do that. There was nothing that my wife's attorney or she could do about it because federal, which is bankruptcy, Trump's state, sorry, uh, <laughs> And um, it overrides it. And so uh, I, I was not going to su uh, suffer any consequences in that regard other than the 10 year ding. But what was interesting was I had to ask this of my divorce, my uh, bankruptcy attorney. Will they be able to go after my wife? And my attorney said, no, you're fine. Because there's she doesn't have the assets and so forth to to take care of it, so there's nothing they can do. And most of the creditors never show up at the hearing, where uh, where it's either um, you know where it's usually dismissed, you know where it's usually okay, you're you're it's discharged. And I find that interesting too. But there's another element too uh, in regards to dealing with this credit, this debt, if you will, and especially consumer debt. And again, I'm not advocating this. Don't get me wrong. But all of these creditors have insurance. And I say credit card companies, I should say. They all have insurance to cover default. If you don't pay your bill and you just refuse and, and you're going to let them, of course, ding your credit, credit report and credit score, they are not out anything because they have insurance that covers that. And that was one of the things that was a game changer for me, but more from a psychological standpoint, let's talk about that a little bit. And then we're going to get into those 10 steps because uh, that's very important for us to, uh, to be dealing with uh, uh, just as a reminder, folks, so we are talking uh, with Janine uh, uh, Bolin and uh, the eight gates dot com is the website the eight gates dot com and we certainly hope that you will uh, go there. We are going to be linked to your website, uh, Janine, so that people can find out more uh, about this this work, but let's talk about the 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 psychological and if you want to even take it to the next level, the spiritual aspects of dealing with uh, uh, our creditors. We willfully chose to, in this case, we'll stick with the consumer debt, borrow that money or use that credit card, which is borrowing that money, 
with the agreement that we will pay it back. But then when we run into hard times and we can't, uh, they start making the proverbial phone calls. Now, I found a real good solution to that, especially nowadays. I don't answer the phone. <laughs> but there's a lot of fear that's put into the hearts of individuals when it comes to this, this particular issue. And, and it's really sad because uh, I don't know how that helps. I mean, I don't know. I suppose they do it because it works. And that's the only reason why anybody would do something like that. And you, just like the, the uh, advertising industry, the reason why the commercials we see are the commercials we see is because, well, it works. Otherwise they wouldn't do it. So how your suggestion on how we would go about um, cutting through all of that stuff to sort of get to that foundational place where we need to be, I would think, to begin the process of using those 10 steps of abundance. So let's talk about you're in a financial mess. You have creditors calling your phone. Uh, you're not answering your phone because you don't want to have to listen to the messages and that sort of thing. I have found the the single best thing to do is take a couple of deep breaths and whatever breathing technique you find helpful to calming down your response. Get yourself in a in a calm space and say, there is a solution, and that solution is is coming, and I am going to find myself in a state of peace. And whatever affirmations you want to use, you you know, use whatever techniques are appropriate for you. Mm -hmm. And then get yourself in that place where you can at least think calmly, because as long as fear is working, you cannot think using your analytical brain. And most people know how to think very well. I know you've been told a lot of other crap, but that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, people are like, I'm not any good at math. I said, good, because we're talking about money and that's not math. You know, like I really hammer that home. I'm like, you know how to use a calculator. You know how to figure out discounts at your local grocery store. You can add numbers with a decimal because it's money. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about math. I want you to talk about how you handle your money. And so that's how we get them out of the fear factor of, I don't, I'm not good at math. And they, th they think they're not good at math because when you say math, they're thinking about rows and rows of desks, overhead fluorescent lights, and having to take a standardized test, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's why I always say, good, because we're going to talk about money, not math. Right. <laughs> Very different thing. So that's the mindset shift. The next thing is, do not allow demons to chase you and scare you from the shadows. This is something that is very common in our society right now, where fear-based marketing is prevalent. It's the demon in the shadow that's going to bite you in the butt if you don't get motivated to do it their way. Yeah. What we're going to do instead is inspire. So anytime you are you, the, you feel people using motivation to make you uh, make a decision, stop. You want inspiration. Inspiration is one of those things where it's much more positive. It's a higher frequency, if you will. Um, and that inspiration is what you're going for. You know the type of life you want to be the freak out of debt right? That's, that's like, number one, you can't think of anything else. It's more like, get me out of this situation. Mm -hmm. All right. If I were to say to you, I guarantee you're going to get out of this situation. Here's the next step. Here's the next step. And that's what the 10 steps of abundance is, is it's like step, step, step to get you out of demons chasing you from the shadows. It keeps you standing in the light so that they cannot do that. Now, how do you do that? You come to grips with how much you owe people. You sit down with a yellow pad of paper and a pencil or a pen, and you sit there with the back of an envelope. I don't care how you do this. And you write down every debt you have. And then you call them. And you say, I want to pay this off. And I am willing to work with you on this. And this is how much I can pay. Figure all that stuff out. Like you take control of your financial situation and you call them with what you are willing to do and what you want to do. And there are 
credit counseling agencies out there. Mm -hmm. There are credit assistant agencies. I highly recommend you work with them so that they can help leverage it. So don't you don't necessarily, I'm, I'm saying you take charge and you call, but have a buddy, have like an agency or a credit uh, repair mm -hmm. group to assist you with this so that you're not approaching this by yourself. But that is how you take control. Then the demons aren't chasing you from the shadows. You're walking in the light. You're making conscious choices about what you want to do with your credit. And you're taking the advice of groups of people who really want you to be successful because it behooves them. Their numbers will look fabulous. Look at how many people we were able to get out of debt, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You want to work with those people. It, it behooves them. It's in their best interest that you be successful. And so you align yourself with those sorts of people. But stop running. Stop and face those demons and stand in the light while you do that. And by standing in the light, it means you have a buddy, you have some sort of credit counseling agency, and you're the one calling them saying, let's make a deal. The other aspect of it too, and I think this is part of this process when you're making these phone calls, remember the person on the other end of the phone did not make the rules. They are just the person at the other end of the phone. And they may be in as bad a shape as you, you know, they may have the same financial challenges that you're facing. Uh, so don't explode at them. Plus the fact, and I've had this happen. I'd say 95% of the time when I take the, have the demeanor of kindness and gentleness and, and agreeability and so forth uh, and, and still pleading my case, so to speak. I usually get what I want may not always get exactly what I want, but it's still agreeable to me. And I'm not promoting this particular one, but there's one I loved. I loved the acronym FDR, you know, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I, I don't know what significance that is. Nonetheless, I, I kind of liked it because it, 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 it had a nice ring to it. Uh, but I think that's real important when we are approaching this. Yeah. And, and matter of fact, um, I used to have a, an Excel spreadsheet <clears throat> that I created and it wasn't that large because it just listed the income and expenses primarily for the major items like rent and uh, car payment um, and uh, the cell phone and electricity. Uh, and this is one of the other aspects that is so frustrating for me is the various vendors when they start raising their rates especially when it comes to electricity. And first of all, there's nothing you can do about it. But the first thing that comes out of my mouth, not to the person on the phone, but just rhetorically is, where do you expect me to get more? You know, I don't work at a fast food restaurant here in California that I'm now making $20 an hour because <laughs> we just got a bump up here in California um, uh, to 20 bucks an hour for uh, people working in fast food restaurants. Um, th that's kind of the first thing that comes to mind. It's a rhetorical question. There is no answer. They just want it. And, um, so now it's like, okay, now I got to go out and get a second job. And that's one of the other things that I want to talk about here too, but we'll get into that a little bit later. And that is, all right, I want to get this paid off faster, but I don't have anything extra coming in. So how do I do that? You know? And I would take it that none of the 10, 10 steps of abundance that you have uh, compiled here has to do with um, a, a getting an inheritance from a dead relative, uh, playing the lottery, uh, or uh, going to Vegas and uh, playing blackjack or roulette. I would take it none of those are part of uh, these 10 steps. No, they're not. Those are wonderful ways for you to wistfully dream and put yourself in a state of stress. Mm -hmm. Now, the attitude, because uh, I was asking you before about the psychological and spiritual impacts of all of this, um, the, the attitude that we have needs to shift and or change, doesn't it? In other words, we have to find a way, and you sort of alluded to this a little earlier, to shift from the attitude of lack. I don't have enough. Is that part of 
the challenge that we as individuals face who are dealing with this this particular conundrum in our society, in our world, in our lives? It, it, it's a part of it. I'm going to go back to the beautiful metaphor, uh, the beautiful situation you have set up here for us on this call. And that is, okay, you're in debt and you're having to contact creditors to figure out what you're going to do next. All right. It's obvious you do not have enough Otherwise, you would not be in this situation. There is something that happened. There are five things that could happen that are beyond your control that could put you in this place. So number one, just accept that. This is where I am. Mm -hmm. Let's not talk about wistful thinking. Let's talk about this is where I am. I am in debt. I have creditors I am calling. And to your point, you're right. The person on the other side of the phone is not the one making the decisions and all that. And so what I like to share with people is be really hard on the problem, be gentle on the people. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you hear me get really direct and all that, it's because that's the mindset I have. I'm going to be really hard on this problem and it is going to go away because by golly, I deem it so. And I don't care what I have to do, or I don't care what I have to learn. I don't care what I have to change but this is not going to be my mode of operation moving forward. Er, ergo, that's going to require me to change me and my behavior. So I'm going to be really hard on that. But I'm going to be very gentle with the people who are helping me move past that. Believe it or not, the creditor on the phone is one of those people that's going to help you. And like you said, because I've been hard on the problem, but I've been gentle with the people, it is amazing what they do for you. I have had cashiers at local um, grocery stores give me a dollar off just because I said, please, thank you. And I ch chatted, chatted nicely to them. Mm -hmm. So realize when you're gentle with people, if they can give you some sort of a break, they're going to give you a break. Mm -hmm. And so realize that that is, an, that is in operation in our capitalistic environment. I hear people all the time kind of busting on capitalism. I'm like, you don't realize how much flexibility we have as capitalistic workers. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the ability to make things pretty easy on each other. If they're civil, if people are civil to me, yeah. it's I can make their life a lot easier. And so realize that you've got help. You have help that is not looked for. Like you don't expect it to come to you, but it really is there as soon as you get hard on that problem. And that problem is you find yourself in this position and now you want to move forward. And so without bringing in any spirituality or mindset or anything, just this very practical tip about being hard on the problem, but gentle on the people will be enough to move you out of that darkness and put you into, there's help here. I just don't know where it is and I know what's coming. And I am going to do my part because I know the, you know, the universe or the matrix or, or life, however you want to mm -hmm. refer to that, is bringing people to me that I may not know yet, but they're coming and they're going to help me with this. What do I need to do? I know to, need to know exactly what situation I'm in exactly how much debt I have, how much money do I have coming in? And if I need more money coming in, I may not be able to solve that one, but I can definitely cut down on my expenses. Mm. And a lot of people have told me, I live beyond my means. What do you say to that? And I look at them and I go, I don't think you've worked hard enough on the problem because you're asking me to solve it when I don't know every element of your life. How could I? Mm -hmm. But you know every element of your life. And this one particular person said, well, I have medical expenses and there's nothing I can do about that. And I said, that's your problem. You think there's nothing you can do with your medical expenses. I disagree vehemently. You can always get a generic. You can always start pushing on your doctors to say, look, I'm in debt. I can't do that. Start working with medical professionals mm -hmm. and say, look, this is what's happening. And people will be like, well, you don't understand. I go, yes, I do. In 1987, my family was a million dollars in debt because of my mother's terminally ill condition. I don't want to hear it. I have worked with so many different types of medical professionals who put us on a cash-only basis just because we knew they knew we could not afford. And so when you start sharing it, not in these sad, you know, sob story, oh, I'm a victim, you got to help me. I don't, I'm not talking that. I'm like, these are the facts. That's how you approach people. Mm -hmm. Hi, these are the facts. I'm working on getting myself out of debt. I have a million dollars in medical debt right now. What can we do to keep my mother comfortable, but at the same time, not add to the debt load that we already are trying to figure out how we're going to get out of? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And just to let you guys know, my father ended up declaring bankruptcy after my mother died because we could not, we, there was no way we could do that. Okay. So yeah. that was 1987. Mm -hmm. The times are different now, but mm -hmm. I am learned to negotiate by being gentle with the people and mm -hmm. by being very analytical by saying, this is where I am. This is what I'm concerned about. How can we work out a solution and then be quiet? Don't say any more. Don't story tell. Just say, these are the facts. How can we solve this? And let them do some of the thinking for you because that's how you bring help in. That's the mindset people need. You are a victor until you decide to become a victim. I chose to be a freaking victor. I was not going to be anybody's victim. Janine Bolin, my guest, uh, and we're talking about uh, money. I mean, just uh, straight up, we're talking about money today. And um, the eightgates.com website is where you want to go to find out more about the work that she's doing. Let's dive in in the next, uh, in the next five, 10 minutes here before we have to wrap things up uh, and talk about the 10, uh, the 10 steps that you've created, the 10 steps of abundance. Uh, where, where, where do we want to start with that? Well, the 10 steps of abundance, let's talk about my students because they're the reason I did it. <laughs> I always <laughs> like bragging about my students because I learned so much from them. <laughs> so I was teaching mathematics and physics at a little tiny liberal arts college. And I was the literally the math and science department <laughs> for this. And so I was teaching uh, physics one year and I noticed that the grades of my students were going down. And I couldn't figure out what was happening. And as I started interviewing them and bringing them into my office, talk to me what's happening, it was they didn't know how to handle money. And as the semester went on, they would start eating ramen, cup of noodles, not very nutritious stuff. And they were buying the $1 for 10 packages of stuff. And that's I'm like, your nutrition is tanking. You cannot think analytically and be in a deficit with your nutrition. We've got to get your nutrition up. So it became standard operating procedure for me to start lecturing the freshmen on how to handle money. And it was by the very, oh, unimaginative and awful title of Money 101. And every freshman had to go through that class so that they knew how to handle their money so they could make it through the course. Okay. So the 10 steps to abundance is basically <laughs> what I taught my students. Like, this is how you do this. This is how you do that. And it's not about mindset. It's about practicality. It's steps. It's like, first do this, then do that, then do the third thing. And the first step is, what kind of life do you want? Most of the financial, not, not all, okay, most of the financial conundrum we get ourselves into is because we don't know what we want. Most of the expenses that we have is because we're unhappy. We don't know why. So we go out and we buy a chocolate bar just because the chocolate hit and the sugar and the chocolate will help us. You know, this is this was my go-to for years. Okay. So this is why I'm, I'm talking about myself here. You know, I'd go and buy a cup of coffee, what have you. When I started adding that stuff up using a spreadsheet, much like what Richard was talking about, where I just started tracking my expenses. I wasn't tracking my income. I wasn't doing anything fancy. Literally, I just was tracking the money I spent. I do not budget, by the way. I don't budget at all. I don't like budgets. Mm -hmm. I track my expenses. And I know where I want to go in life. I know what kind of lifestyle I want. And because of that, I self-regulate all on my own. The locus of control is totally with me. And that's how I stay a victor of my assets. Mm. Well, you know, I, I find it quite fascinating that there are people out there and there's one gentleman I'm thinking of that I, I've been listening. I'm not actively listening to, but I've heard him on a number of radio. And of course, I'm sure he's got a television program and even a podcast nowadays and all this kind of stuff. And um, I had a problem with some of his 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 guidance, if you will. Uh, and you, you know him, I'm sure. Uh, Dave Ramsey. Oh yeah. I've actually spoken to his team. He has a yeah. really good team of people and with the puppy prince or the financial peace university or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the only reason was because, uh, you know, I, I kept thinking, okay, you're, you're, 
and, and maybe it's because he uses tough love. Maybe that's the way he describes it. Uh, and maybe that's why I, 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 I had a, 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 you know, some of it rubbed me the wrong way, but for the most part, I liked what he had to say, uh, but um, everybody's got their own perspective. Everybody has their own ideas on, on solving the problem. And as I was sharing earlier about listening to some of the economic news and, and the economists, when they would come out with these different reports, whatever it was that they were coming out with weekly, monthly, annually. And the economists were never happy. It didn't make any difference how good or bad the news was as they interpreted it. The economists were never happy. And so I would put out the, uh, the query to economists. I put it out today. What numbers would make you happy? Because when the news comes out and we are told, okay, this is the situation, you know, we're in recession, we're in depression, we have inflation, we have this, we have that, we have the other. Do you think that we're listening too much to the outside world when it comes to money and our financial situations that we need to just stop doing that? Because uh, it's not helping. Well, if you're listening to this podcast, this radio show, this YouTube video, realize that we happen to be in April of 2024 mm -hmm. and it's an election year. Yeah. And that always colors the news in mm -hmm. the United States. So yes, I think we listen too much to the outside world. I want to know, like if Richard were to come to me and say, hey, Janine, help me out. The very first thing I'd say is what kind of life do you want? And if he paused, I'm like, I'm not going to work with you until you can tell me what kind of life you want. What is it that you are working for? What is it that is the eventual lifestyle that you want to have? Mm. It, I was on a 14-year personal plan. Like it was going to take me 14 years to get to my goal. Did I care? Absolutely not. I knew, exact, I knew exactly where I was going, where I was headed. I knew what kind of lifestyle I wanted. And if it took me 14 years, well, it was going to take me 14 years no matter what I did, right? So I didn't care. I did it in seven. Mm. I did it in seven. And that was even with 2008's crash. So that's why it's yeah. so important that you know what you want. And don't listen to economists. Don't listen to any of that stuff because you just keep focusing on you doing yours. Like when we had the 2008 crash and I watched 47% of my stock assets tank, you know what I said to myself? Hmm. Well, it's going to take me a little longer, but I just kept plugging away at keeping my expenses low and putting my savings into assets. Okay. And I kept working on that in my way. And it was amazing. The very mm -hmm. next year, some stock that I had purchased split. Some people would call me lucky. I wasn't lucky, but some people would say it was like some stock split. I sold it and I was able to get to the lifestyle that I, and I'm still living in it. I'm still living in it. I'm living in the state I want to live in. I'm living in a house I absolutely adore. You know, I have the life that I, I had projected for myself. Now, the thing is, I don't have it according to somebody else's model. People walk into my house and they go, wow, you have a really old house, but you got all this new stuff in it, like the tech, you know, for the like the thermostat is electronic and stuff like that. But they're like, you have kind of an old house and your furniture really isn't, you know, like I don't have vestiges of wealth around me. Mm -hmm. I have the wealth carried around in my heart. And that's what I want for everybody here is to be able to live in that freedom of being a victor of your own financial situation. You know, I was looking at the the myriad of books that you have uh, available on your website. Uh, one, uh, I'm not sure how it applies with our conversation here, but nonetheless, it is one of the books that she's written, folks. Co-authored, actually, Buddha Behind Bars. She <laughs> yeah, she also has um, uh, authoring podcast. Uh, which is rather a, an interesting one too. Uh, the thriving solopreneur, uh, yeah. solopreneur, which I think I'd fall under that category because uh, during my divorce, they tried to uh, get me to uh, give a, a, an amount to what my business was worth. And I said, it's worth nothing. And, and of course, what they're trying to do is give me, give a price on the equipment that I used. I says, it's, it has no value whatsoever without me. 
Mm -hmm. I'm the one that gives it value. But eventually I did have to give them a, you know, a breakdown nonetheless. Uh, then you have uh, expressing, if I'm reading that right, yeah, expressing the divine. Yes. And uh, it is is not, it is spiritual, not religious. And it is, <laughs> it, and it is a guidebook. Uh, for the enlightened soul, and you have multiple volumes of that, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, finding the divine, seeking the divine, and uh, and several others as well. And I want to touch on that real quickly here before we run out of time, uh, because uh, that's obviously one of the focal points of this program is, you know, the new paradigms for a new world and and uh, looking for uh, the the inner strength to do the outer work. And I think you've given us a great deal to think about in that regards to have that inner strength. Uh, I think that one phrase that you've you've stated basically is be hard on the the situation, soft on the people, mm -hmm. gentle on the people, if you will. Yes. And, and that has to come from within you. You know, it's not something that you can uh, just make make up uh, and it comes with practice. And I have to say that I'm one of the first ones to admit I have been challenged by dealing with people on the phone. Uh, and sometimes, especially if it's a debt collector, boy, they come at you. They're like bulldogs and they want you to get upset because then you get into the fear and all that stuff. But you completely disarm them when you stay calm and you say, no, here's what I want to do. I want to take care of this. However, I'm going to need some help. And um, maybe you can help me out here. And, and like I said before, many of these folks are in the similar situations you are. They're trying to do the same thing you are. And you show them some kindness and they just might return the favor. Uh, but this whole aspect of, of the, the, the spiritual elements, and I kind of brought that up earlier um, in terms of how, 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 how does our intuition, because I consider that as part of our inner life, our, our spiritual life, how does intuition play into all of this? That's why I was re encouraging everybody to move out of motivation and move into inspiration. That's how you kick in the intuition. Mm. And a lot of people already know this. So let me confirm what you already know in your heart. And that is when you are motivated, that is an external force operating in your life. You are motivated to make sure you have food on the table. You're motivated to make sure you get yourself uh, water, right? You're motivated to find shelter. These are things that are very, what we like to call the alligator brain, the very primitive brain. It motivates us mm -hmm. to move because otherwise we will die. Right. <laughs> so we don't want you in motivation because it's not in the analytical section. It's not, it's not calling on the two greatest assets you have your head and your heart. Mm -hmm. Your head is very good. I don't care what somebody has told you. I don't care if you think you're stupid. You're not because you're listening to Richard. You're listening to people. You're learning. Every day you get a little bit better. And I just want to say thank you. You keep fighting that good fight because as long as you keep educating yourself, you're going to be fine. The other thing I want to confirm that you already know is that sometimes you have done something where you were like, you know, I really don't feel good about this. And you were pressured to go into it anyway. I don't care what it was. And then you feel bad because you allowed yourself to be pressured into it. Please give up the guilt. As a recovering Catholic, <laughs> I give you permission to give up the guilt. And to my Jewish friends out there, I just say, mm -hmm. thank you. You've taught me so much about exactly. the guilt thing. So don't feel guilty. Realize you're a different person today than you were when you made that choice, when you were pressured and you've learned from it. You're not going to mm -hmm. let that happen again. So yeah. you work with inspiration. You are the victor of your financial situation and don't let anyone tell you otherwise because they don't know what you've been through. Yeah. You know, uh, very quickly here, um, when I look back at all of this, the money that I have spent on a very myriad of different things in the 63, almost 64 years that I've been here, one in particular that my wife, present wife and I spent at the end of almost $7,000 spent we got a quick claim deed to get out of a timeshare because we were pressured into it and we made the decision granted it was our decision, but nonetheless, and I'm going, you're worried about what you're in debt with now. Think about how much money quote unquote you have already spent on things you don't even have anymore. Okay. 
And this is this is a pittance. This is nothing by comparison. So let it go, and then get into the mindset that uh, uh, Janine is talking about. Janine, uh, we're going to have to wrap things up. I uh, want to thank you so much for being with us. I do have three final questions I want to ask you that I ask all of my guests. But I really do appreciate all of the information that you've given us and the guidance. And um, I look forward to working with you uh, in the in the very near future. I look forward to it, too. Thank you so much for having me on. I want to ask those three final questions. And the first of those is, who is Janine Bolin? I'm a human being on planet Earth running around, free falling through space at 286,000 miles per second squared. <laughs> What gets you up in the morning? The sunlight. Hmm. And finally, what was your best day? Today. Hmm. Janine Bolin, thank you so much once again. And folks, so go to the 8gates.com uh, website. Uh, that is the website, folks. Uh, the 8gates.com. And that is the number eight. I should be more specific in that regard. And uh, we'll be linked to that website once again. Janine Bolin, thank you again. And I thank you for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World, where we're giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And until our next broadcast, podcast, video cast, love to lol. Jeanette, I am still listening. Dad, continue to be happy because I am. Smokey, I'll see you on the other side. And to my dear friend Zorro, aho. Aho. Uh -huh.